and because uh, you didn't deserve it. Um, you know, <clears throat> dads are remarkable people. And I found some pictures that describe exactly how men think. Okay, now girls, you will not be able to appreciate the brilliance behind what's going on in these pictures, okay? But here's the first one. Uh, I want to make this point that dads are very, very creative. For example, this man had a head that was obviously too tall for him to trim, uh, perhaps even off a ladder. So what does he do? He hires a crane to pick up his riding lawnmower to mow the top of his head. Is that brilliant or what? And see, girls, what you don't realize is, is that every man in the room is saying, you know, that makes sense, but I would have done it a little different. You know, maybe I would have picked up a tractor with a, set, a six foot wide bush hog and then I could have done it in one swipe and wouldn't have had to make a different swipe. Girls, you just don't get it. Dads are extremely creative. For example, here's another one right here that you'll think of. Dads learn to use what they have. It is a real pain to have to pull your sea dew to the beach on a trailer. So why not just stick it in the hatchback? Doesn't that make more sense? Isn't that a safer way to do it? See, girls, you cannot appreciate the brilliance of that maneuver. But every dad in the room has done something like that in his lifetime, one time or another. He's done something like that. Like hauling goats in the back of a car. That's very similar, hauling goats in the back of a car. How about the next one here? Now, I know you guys are all city slickers, so you've never done any pond skiing. All you need for pond skiing, you need a pull vehicle. In this case, it's a four-wheeler. You need a piece of plywood and you need two ropes. Has anybody ever done this other than me? Okay, Austin has done it, okay. Almost every man has done something like this. Uh, we actually didn't have a four-wheeler. We were just kids the first time we did it and we didn't go around the pond like they are. We got on one side of the pond with a log rope and my buddy had a, had a pony. <laughs> he tied the rope to the pony and hit the pony and I had hold the rope on the piece of plywood and we went flying across the pond. Anyhow, you got, you got to appreciate that. Dads are fearless. Dads, if you're fearless, say amen. Amen? All right, let's see, is there another one? Oh, yeah. Dads sometimes do funny things. Okay, the air conditioner is out in the car. So how do we fix it? We go to the store and we buy a 120 volt generator. We stick that on the back of the car and we put a window unit in the car. Is that brilliant or what? See, dads are brilliant. Every man in the house is thinking, I could do that, but I would do it just a little bit different, right? I would do something just a little different. I Maybe I would put the uh, generator on top of the roof or something like that. So anyhow, dads do funny things. What is regrettable in our society today is that dads in the media and society uh, and just about everything that's going on dads and godly men and men in general that are really men in general <coughs> have been made to look like idiots they've been made to look by society and the pc culture uh, made to look like uh, there's no necessity for those kind of men anymore there's no they don't they serve no function they do more damage than they do good that is what our society says about men. Our society has been dominated by liberal thinking. And this liberal thinking for years now has denigrated the, the male. The male species. That, in other words, for whatever reason, our society uh, wants to lose the differentiation between male and female. Now, we can, bring, we can blame that on our society, we can blame that on uh, liberal, liberals, we can blame that on whatever, but we need to blame it on, on the source, don't we? The source of that lie is the father of all lies, who is Satan. The father of all lies, the father of all deception. He knows that if, they can, if he can denigrate the position of father, if he can denigrate the position of man in society, then he has a leg up on destroying the family unit. And if he can destroy the family unit, then he can destroy society. Why would Satan want to destroy society? Because he hates humans. He was here on this planet by himself after the rebellion. And what did God do? God put humans on his planet. 
and gave them authority over him. And when he wanted to destroy the first humans, Adam and Eve, who did he go after? Did he go after Adam and open combat? Is that what he did? No. He went to Eve through lies and deception. And through Eve's falling for the lies and the deception, he got at it. So in our society today, males are being put down across society by lies and deception that are fostered by Satan and then utilized by very liberal groups of people. It's not that way all over the world, by the way. It's that way in the United States of America. But in most third world countries, it's not that way all over the world. Now, are, are dads of any value whatsoever? Listen to a couple of statistics here. <clears throat> Children with a mom and dad are more likely to succeed in life. Now, if you're a single mom and you're raising a child, then God bless you. And that is a situation that a lot of people find them, themselves in sometime. And, and the church needs to help uh, widows and orphans as much as we can. And we need to help single moms as much as we can. But, but, but if you're a single mom, now listen now, if you're a single mom and you're raising, a, especially, if, well, if you're raising a girl or a boy, but especially a boy, you need to find somebody, either through the Big Brother uh, a Society or whatever, you need to find some male influence <clears throat> that your child can see. Uh, because they need to see that male influence in their family, in their structure, in their lives. They need to see that. They need to feel that. They need to have part in that. So, <clears throat> children with moms and dads, they're more likely to succeed in life. Children with a mom and a dad <clears throat> are more likely to have intact families themselves. When they see a mom and a dad, even if the mom and dad fight a little bit, even if the mom and dad don't always get along, but the mom and dad stay together, they're more likely to have intact families. When I do pre-marriage counseling, when Debbie and I, now I only do it with Debbie, we only counsel together now, but when, I, when we do that together, the first question, we, first question we ask is whether or not the people are saved and that are wanting to get married. Because if one of them is and one of them is not, then that presents a lot of problems, a lot of complications. The second question we ask is, <clears throat> were their parents, are they from a family that has ever been divorced? Because if they're from a family that has been divorced, then that brings all kinds of baggage that they have in their lives that they may not even be aware of in their lives into their own marriage. And it creates problems that they maybe not, did not anticipate. So children <clears throat> that are from a, a, a family that has mom and dads and that family has stayed intact, they're much more likely to have intact families uh, themselves. Children with a mom and dad are less likely to get in trouble or go to prison. <clears throat> I tell you what, Moms, dads, you need that strong male influence in the family. You need the ability to say, hey, you just wait till your father gets home. When my mother would say that, buddy, I'd start begging. Please don't tell him, please don't tell him, please don't tell him. Because I knew I was going to get a spanking even if I needed one or not. I was going to get one just because mom told dad, spank God. He didn't act right today. Okay, off comes the belt. Bang, you know, here we go. And so that's just the way it was. And Debbie, the same way, I'd come home. She said, you know, Matthew needs a spanking. He did not act well today. Okay, here we go. Bang. And so there needs to be discipline in the family, and most of the time that disciplinarian is the father. I remember that Debbie uh, used to try to discipline the kids sometimes, <clears throat> and uh, she'd take a, usually she, her instrument of destruction was a yardstick, usually. And uh, I remember as the kids got older, she'd pull that yardstick off, out, and I remember one time she hit John and broke the yardstick on his, on his you know where, and, and he just started laughing at her. And she broke two more yardsticks before it's all over with, just trying to keep them from laughing. So dads need to be the enforcer. They need to be the discipline in the family. Uh, and so families need dads. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw this one out here because it's a legitimate statistic. <clears throat> Boys from families without dads are 60% more likely to turn to the homosexual lifestyle than boys that come from intact families. I didn't invent that statistic. That's just what it is. So if you see that as a problem in our society today, which it is, and that's where a lot of the pressure in our society is coming from, our, our society is deteriorating 
uh, morally speaking, every single day. It's, it's almost exponential. And a lot of that comes from now that uh, I can't even keep track of all the letters, but, but from the homosexual uh, agenda that's destroying our society. And a lot of that is because of the lack of male influences over boys in their homes when they were growing up. They didn't have that male influence. And so like I said, single moms, if you're raising a child, especially if they're a boy, then I'm telling you right now, you need to get some male influence in their life. And really, even if you're raising a daughter the same way, because the daughters that are raised without that male influence of a father figure, uh, not a good thing. So uh, fathers are extremely important to our families. They are the cornerstone of the family. Uh, they are the cornerstone for our children. They are, hey, listen, moms are the encouragers. Moms are the ones that take care of the needs of the family. But the cornerstone of every family is the dad. That is the cornerstone of the family. Let's go on. <clears throat> and Jesus says that a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and <clears throat> two shall become one flesh. In the marriage ceremony, I, I don't know if that, in, in the marriage ceremonies that I perform, this is the way it works, and most of the ones that I've seen this way it works. The groom is up here, and, and he's smiling, he's waiting for his bride to come in. And so the bride comes down the aisle, normally accompanied by the father. I have seen recently where the bride is accompanied by the father and the mother, but nevertheless, the bride comes forward, and uh, um, then uh, the pastor will say something. Well, who now gives that comes to give this bride to this to this man? And it used to be that the father would say, "I do." And now today, it's more common that the mom and dad say, uh, "Her her mother and I do." <clears throat> but technically speaking, according to Scripture, here's the way it's supposed to work. You see, before the bride gets married, she's part of a family unit. And that family unit is formed around the husband. And that's why the daughter has the husband's, her dad's name. That's why the wife takes the husband's name. Because every family group is formed around not the wife, but the husband. And that's why women, when they get married, they change their names to that. Okay? And so here's what's happening. When a girl gets married, then the father is transferring the responsibility and the authority. Now you may say, hey, this is just like third century or something. This is not, I, I'm telling you, this is from the Bible. This is the way it's supposed to work. The, the father is transferring responsibility and authority for his daughter to this man that she's about to marry. And this man is leaving his family. He's not going to be tied to his mama's strings. He's not going to be tied to his father's uh, authority anymore. He started a brand new family unit. And when that father gives his daughter to that man, they are forming a new family unit. And the cornerstone of that family unit is the husband. That's the way it works. Now, is there equality in the marriage? You betcha, it has to be. <clears throat> is there take and give in the marriage? You betcha, it has to be. But the family unit, technically, according to the Word of God, is formed around the husband. He is the cornerstone of the family. So let's go on. So here's a picture of a godly dad. I wrote down a couple of things that a picture of a godly dad. If you want a godly dad, if you want a really good family, then you need a godly dad as the cornerstone of that family. Number one, he needs to be saved. You can't have a godly family if the if the cornerstone of that family is not saved. Now, my dad wasn't saved until I was 16 years old, but 16 years of age. I got saved when I was two years old, because I mean, not at uh, nine years old, but I started going to church when I was two years old, because that's when my mom got saved. And when my mom got saved, she started dragging me to church. So praise God, I'm saved, not because of my dad, but because of my mother. But, because my dad was lost until I was 16, I lived in a family that stayed together, but I also lived in a family where my dad would disappear for days. My dad was an alcoholic. He was a good guy. He was a successful guy. He was a great athlete. But <clears throat> that's what I saw because he wasn't saved. Once he got saved, things turned around, but I was already 16 years of age. 
So a lot of the things that were in me that I didn't even know were in me, I picked up from my dad, not wanting to pick them up from my dad, to be honest with you, from the time up until I was 16 years of age when he got saved. So in order to have a godly house and a godly family, the godly dad has to be stay, saved. And he does not just say, yes, preacher, I'm saved. He has to stay close to Jesus in prayer. And he needs to lead his family to Jesus in prayer. And there needs to be times at home that the family has uh, prayer times together, even with little children. Bible study times together as little children. I remember my two oldest sons, Don and John, that I had a list of 100 scriptures that I kept memorized all the time. I just constantly, I would do, basically I'd do about 10 a night. And I would just keep going through 10 a night by memory. And so I decided that I would do that with Don and John. They were just little fellas. And they weren't even saved yet. They were little fellas. So I started teaching them the scriptures that I said every day. I started teaching them those same scriptures. And Don and John to this day can quote you those same hundred scriptures that I, that I go through. They can quote you those because they learned them as little children. Now I did not do that with Matthew and Elizabeth. I probably should have. But that's a godly, a godly man's responsibility is to do that. I used to leave my family at least once a week in some sort of Bible study. Not just a little story time or anything like that. But uh, we would lead in a Bible study in the house so that the kids learned what was in the Bible. I even bought them all little Schofield Bibles just like mine so that we could all study together. And they did that. And my children know a lot about the Bible. <laughs> Were they godly kids all the way up and never got into any trouble? No. They got into a lot of trouble. Did God have to rescue them out of their temptations the way He rescued me? Yes. And praise God, they're all rescued now. It took a while. It took a lot of prayer on, on Debbie's part and on my part, but God rescued them out of their temptations just like God rescued me. But a godly dad has that responsibility. A godly dad, if he wants to lead his family correctly, he needs to follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit. He needs to walk in the Spirit. A godly dad accepts his role as the spiritual leader of his family. Just like a pastor is the spiritual leader of the church, the godly dad is the spiritual leader of his family. Now, that doesn't mean that the mom doesn't have a tremendous influence, because I'll bet, I guarantee you, she will have a tremendous influence in that family. But the leader of that family, listen now, if you're listening, say amen. The person responsible to get the kids to church, the person responsible to make sure the kids are living the way they should, that's not the mom's responsibility. Sometimes the moms have to pick up that responsibility, but that's not their responsibility. That's the dad's responsibility. A lot of dads shirk that responsibility. Even if they go to their kids to church or whatever, they shirk that responsibility, but it's their responsibility. When the kid says, I don't want to go to church today, the dad says, get up, you're going to church today. I don't feel like going to church today. You get up, you're going to church today. When you're 18 years old, you can pay your own way. You don't live with them anymore. Then you can not go to church if you don't want to, but until then, you're going to church today. That's what the dad says. If you're a smart parent, that's what you tell your child. You're going to church today. You say, well, that'll cause the ch child to be rebellious. Yes, maybe. But they'll never forget that experience. And the Lord will rescue them out of their temptations at some point. Every single one of my four children got saved early. Every single one of my children knew all about the Bible, knew all about Jesus, loved Jesus, knew all about Him. Every single one of my children rebelled against God at some point in their lives. Every single one of my children had been rescued by Jesus, just like I was. So you lay that groundwork for a child when, you're, when they're young, all the way up until they leave your house, and you require that they uh, go to church. You require that they read their Bible. You require that. These people today say, well, we just don't want to influence what he believes. Baloney. Would you rather him go to hell? You have to influence what a child believes. You tell them about Jesus. You tell them why they need Jesus. Not just that Jesus loves them. Yes, tell them that. But tell them why they need Jesus. That they're sinners. That they need Jesus. They need to be saved. I promise you that if a godly dad will accept that responsibility, it'll come back 
and great rewards in his life with his children laying on. Right now, there's no greater thrill in my life than to see my children uh, being close to God. I mean, that is, that is just fantastic. <clears throat> a godly man and a godly dad has the responsibility to keep his marriage and his family together. Now listen, I've been married uh, let's see, what, 48 years. It's going to be 48 years this year, 47 years. <clears throat> I would like to tell you that every year has been pure bliss. Uh, but then you would know I, that I'm a liar and that I need to repent. That's not true. Marriage is tough. And uh, it is true that once you make it to about 20 years of marriage, it doesn't necessarily get any easier but it's more relaxed. That pressure there that there might be a separation, might be a divorce, that kind of goes away. But it's always tough. And no matter what age you are, it always presents its own problems. Now one of the things, the first Promise Keeper meeting that I went to was in Memphis, Tennessee. We took, I don't know, 50, 50 guys and we knew something special was going to happen when we stopped, I guess what interstate where we are. We were heading down the interstate that runs parallel to the Mississippi River down from where we are up in Wycliffe on the Mississippi River down to Memphis on the Mississippi River. We're over on the Missouri side. Anyhow, whatever interstate that is, I think it's 57. We stopped at a rest station and there was like a 10 minute wait just to get into the men's restaurant. So we knew right then that something significant was happening in Memphis. You never go to a rest station and have to wait to get into the men's restroom. The line is always to get into the women's restroom, right? Well, this was a line to get into the men's restroom for those of y'all that hadn't picked up what's happening here. So there's something special happening in Memphis. So we get to Memphis, you got about 40 something of us, I don't know. And we're sitting there in the football stadium and, and a, a, a really good friend of mine, not from my church that I was pastoring, but from Lone Oak was with me. And he and his wife had had a few problems, significant problems. And um, during that conference, he took response, even though, in my estimation, they were not his problems that cre had created the situation, he took responsibility for it. And when he got home, he went immediately, from the parking lot of our church, he went immediately home to begin to deal with those problems. And he dealt with them. Today, he and his wife are very happy. They're actually foreign missionaries. And that's what happens when, some, when God gets hold of a godly man. And that's what happens when a godly man takes responsibility for what happens in his family and what happens in his marriage. And so people, people will tell you that the responsibility for keeping a marriage together is, is, uh, takes two people to do. And this is true, but one person has to take the lead always and that has to be the man now that flies in the face of what you hear in society but that who, that's who has to lead the family listen hey listen listen if you're listening say amen if you want to be the leader of your family you have to take responsibility for everything that happens in your family leaders take responsibility of those that they lead so if you want to be the leader in your family that's what God, that's how God planned it. Then you have to take responsibility for what happens. And if things aren't going well, man, in your family, then it's your responsibility to get it straightened out, whatever you got to do. Whatever you got to do. If you got to eat humble pie, eat humble pie. If you got to, whatever you got to do. As long as it's godly, take care of it. Here, here are godly dad's responsibilities. He sets the example for his family. Jesus even told us in John chapter 5 that he didn't know anything that, that he was supposed to do except what the Father showed him to do. And what the Father showed him, that's what he did. So if that's what Jesus does, then that's what our family does. We set the example. He leads his family in worshiping Jesus. He disciplines his children. He teaches his children how to love and serve Jesus. And he stays strong in the Lord so he can protect his family. My dad was my hero. The last five years of his life or four years of his life, he and I were really close. We played golf two or three times a week until he got so sick he couldn't play golf anymore. Uh, we worked together. We owned the same company together. We were really close. He was my hero. He could do anything. He was a scratch golfer. 
He was the kind of guy that could beat anybody in a pool room. He bowled multiple games of 300 in bowling. I mean, he could do anything. But he didn't get saved until I was 16. So, he was my hero, but he was not the greatest influence on my life. So, who was the greatest influence on my life? My grandfather, Preston. He taught me how to drive a Willis Jeep and to pull game mowers behind it. He taught me how to drive a tractor and to mow the grass. Maybe he was just getting close to me so he'd have somebody to mow all of his yards. We had like 15 acres of grass to mow and maybe he was getting tired of mowing grass. I don't know. But he taught me everything. And here's a man born in 1888. Say, you remember, I don't, is anybody in here confessing if you are? Is anybody in here a charismaniac? Anybody? My parents, my grandparents were. You know what a charismaniac? Pentecostals, okay? Or Church of God or Apostles' Creed or whatever. But anyhow, there was this big revival going on at the turn of the 20th century called the Azusa Street Revival. And my grandparents got caught up in that. My grandfather got saved at that time. And him and my grandmother started six, were, were families that helped start six Pentecostal churches uh, in Tennessee and in Kentucky. The last one being Full Gospel Tabernacle uh, there in Paducah, Kentucky that still exists today that's a large church. He was a godly man. And uh, everybody in the family recognized him. He had a sixth grade education, came from the coal fields over in Kentucky, in, in, from Seabury, Kentucky. Not, that's not where you go down in the pit, that's where it's all open mind. Uh, but he was a businessman. He was a business genius, actually. He only had a sixth grade education. Let me tell you something. People that are geniuses in business, they didn't get it because they went to college. They're geniuses in businesses. They're just made that way. They're just, God just creates them that way because he was a genius in business. And he took our little business that he was doing during the Depression to survive and turned it into the business that, that, that I still work for, that my son now owns today. Uh, and, you know, I'm third generation in the business. My sons are fourth generation in the business, and that's all because of my grandfather. So my dad was my hero, but my grandfather influenced my life more than any, anyone else because I saw in him a steadiness and a strength, and I saw in him Jesus. When, if you've ever been to a Pentecostal church, when you go into a Pentecostal church, the leaders of the church set up on the stage where the preacher preaches. Have you ever, anybody ever seen that? They all set up in chairs at the, on the, on the church. They're the elders of the church. That's where my grandfather sat. <clears throat> and everybody looked to him. When he died, over a thousand people came to his funeral. They couldn't even get in the church. They opened the windows and they all surrounded the church because he had such great influence over so many people. He was my male influence up until I was 16 and really up until 1975 when me and my dad got a lot closer together than we had been before. So think about that. that he was born in 1888. Today is 2019. So that's 130 years. That's 130 years of influence. So think about this. Here's a challenge to everybody in this room. You can have 130 years of influence if you'll let them in, if you'll live a godly life. You can influence 130 years of people if you'll have a godly life. Because he influenced not only his own children, which he had kind of, you know, didn't, they were shaky, but he influenced his grandchildren. And he influenced me, which means that's influenced my children, which means that's influenced my grandchildren. So a minimum of 130 years of influence. How can you help a man be a godly man? How can you help dads be godly dads? <clears throat> Recognize and acknowledge their responsibility for you before God. Wives, respect your husbands. That's what they want more than anything else. They want respect. If you're constantly degrading them or putting them down or making fun of them, see, husbands and wives don't think the same. And so you can't do that. You have to, fathers need to feel respect. The children obey your father. Forgive your father when he does things that upset you. Forgive him. Love him in spite of himself. Thank him for taking the responsibility for you. And while he's still alive, make sure that you stay in close communication with him. Man, I would love. My grandfather died in 1964. My dad died in 1979. 
I would love to have a conversation with both of them today. That would be awesome. But I can't do that. They're not around anymore. If your parents and grandparents are still alive, today is the day to make sure you have conversation. And tomorrow is the day to make sure you have conversation. You stay close to them. Joshua said, serve today whom you will serve. And I say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How about you, Dad, or future Dad, or Granddad? For you, who are you going to serve? If you say, I'm going to serve the Lord, but you serve the world, and you serve other things, your kids and your family will pick up on that hypocrisy. So if you say, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, then you've got to stand for something. I remember we were playing, we played it. My two oldest boys, and really Matthew too, we played in what was called the Corey League, a baseball league, when we lived in Kentucky. And that was a league that encompassed Missouri, Illinois, and Kentucky, and was based out of St. Louis, Missouri. It was a big league at one time. At one time, the Corey League was much larger than the Little League, but it had shrunk to those three states. And we had gone to St. Louis to play in the tournament. We had won all of our Friday games, we had won all of our Saturday games, and we were set up for Sunday morning uh, to play in the championship of the Corey League Championship uh, in, the, in the high flight of our age group, or the Class A flight of our age group. And uh, I can remember uh, my son saying, well, you won't be here tomorrow, will you? I said, no, I won't be here tomorrow. He said, can I stay and play? I said, yes, you can stay and play. He, he said, you're going home to go to church, aren't you? I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I was, I was a manager. And uh, I remember my son uh, telling his teammates, saying, hey, listen, my dad's going to go home to Paducah to go to church because God's more important to him than us one in this tournament. And some of those kids understood that. Some of the kids didn't understand that. At least two of my coaches didn't understand that. But I did that, and they still won the tournament. Amen? I remember I was playing in the golf I, I was in the tournament. I used to play a lot of tournaments. And I was the last tournament I played in, I told them I had to play after 1 o'clock. I had to play after 1 o'clock because I couldn't play in the tournament otherwise. And I told the group that I was signed up to play with in this tournament. I, I said, I can't play. and I'm not going to miss church to play God. And uh, you, you may think that's narrow thinking, but attending church is important in a lot of ways. What if I started missing church because I wanted to go bass fishing? What if I started missing church because I wanted to go kill some ducks? What if I started missing church because I just had to play in this tournament and just had to play in that tournament? What kind of signal would that send to my wife? What kind of signal would that send to my children? What kind of signal would that send to anyone that I was trying to win to the Lord? See, people watch us. And if we tell somebody we're a Christian and we're a godly man and we're, or we're trying to be a godly man, I like that better. They're going to watch us and see if our walk matches our talk. And so they teed us up. They showed our Sunday tea time. And I was leading my flight. They showed our Sunday tea time at 1.30. I mean, at, at, at 11.30. And I told the guys... I called the tournament. I said, I'm out of the tournament. And they said, well, you're leading your flight. I said, that doesn't matter. I'm out of the tournament. And I told my group, I said, I'm not going to be there today. And they said, you're crazy. I said, it doesn't matter if I'm crazy or not. I'm not going to be there today because I'm not going to miss church to go play golf, even if it's a tournament. Now, I'm not trying to pump myself up because every one of those things that I've done good like that, I've done something stupid and not been extremely godly. That's happened, okay? But I'm just telling you, that if you're going to be a godly man, your walk has to match your talk. And sometimes you just got to lay it all out there even if it doesn't make sense. You understand what I'm saying? And people will see that. People will take note of that. I had a guy come to me and uh, he said, hey, I'm having trouble with drinking. He says, I never see you drink, but I know you used to drink. I said, that's right. He said, well, how did, how did you break it? I said, I just quit. He says, he says, you mean you just quit? I said, I mean, I just quit drinking. I just determined that I wasn't going to drink anymore, and I quit drinking. He says, don't you still want to drink? I said, you betcha, but I don't. I said, you just got to quit drinking. So see, I told a friend of mine this. I had a teacher in high school that when I went first moved back to Paducah, he was a great influence in my life, and I knew he was a Christian man because 
he had been a good influence in high school. And I went over one day to the club where we were members where we played golf all the time. Here he is down at the bar with a bunch of other guys drinking a beer. And that just really bothered me. And I told him that. I said, you know, listen, you've been a great influence in my life. And I said, you know, you can do what you want to. But I said, that's not a real good example. I said, you've got all kinds of kids that you taught in school. They're coming here and they say you drink a beer, so they think it's okay for them to drink a beer. And everybody here is going to be saying, well, there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. Well, that's okay if you can do it and not let it destroy your life. That's fine. But I've never seen anything good come out of alcohol, to be honest with you. And it can absolutely dominate your life if you're not careful. And so how can you be an influence over somebody? You never know when that guy's going to come up saying, hey, I have trouble with alcohol, and I know you used to drink a long time ago, and you don't drink anymore. What did you do? How can you have an influence in a person's life like that if you're just living the way you want to live, not thinking about your influence over somebody else, not thinking about the influence over your children? You know why I almost became an alcoholic in college? I was an alcoholic in college. You know why that was? It's because I had seen from 0 to 16 years of age my dad being an alcoholic. Did I hate my dad for being an alcoholic? You betcha. Did I love my dad? You betcha. Have you ever had a love-hate relationship? You betcha. I hated what I saw in him. I hated the alcoholism. I hated him coming in late. I hated the way he talked to my mother when he came in late. But what did I do when I got out on my own? <laughs> I became an alcoholic. Did you know that 90% of people who become alcoholics had some close family member, usually a dad, a mom, an uncle, a grandparent, that were alcoholics? Now, I'm not preaching against alcohol today, necessarily. I'm just telling you, for me, I've I got to stay away from it. And I'm going to stay away from it. I'm just saying to you that your walk has to match your talk if you're going to have influence over anybody. If you want to invite somebody to church, that's fantastic. You do that. You just make sure that on Sunday morning you're not out doing something and they see you out doing something and you're not in church. Because it's going to be really hard for you to get them. Our walk has to match our talk. Dads, our walk has to match our talk. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all the dads here today. I thank you for all the men here today. And I pray, Lord, you want us to be godly dads. You want us to be godly men. I pray, Lord, that you give us the wisdom to do so. I pray that you give us the strength to do so. I pray, Lord, that you give us the discipline to do that. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will constantly speak to us and lead us and guide us and convict us when we do stupid things, convict us when we sin and lead us back on track. Keep us on track, Lord, so that we can be a witness to the people out there who need you. We are your witnesses. Help us to be those witnesses, first to our family, and then to all those other people that we have connection with. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand.